every week. Hi, everybody. This is Joanne with Read Science, joined once again by my co-host, Jeff. And we are here today. We're going to talk about children's science books with author Nicola Davies. I hope I did that the right British way. <laughs> you did so perfect. Thank She's joining us from the UK, and uh, you're in Wales right now? I am. I'm looking out on lovely Welsh hills out of my window. Oh, wonderful. So, um, and, and of course, I'm in Illinois, and Jeff's in uh, near D.C. in Maryland. Mm -hmm. But um, So, uh, I met Nicola just in February at the AAAS meeting at, in San Jose, and you were there to receive a prize from the Subaru Book and Film Prize uh, for your book, Tiny Microbes, which I know Jeff has above his ear there. Yep. Tiny Creatures, <laughs> the World of Microbes. Yes, it's got it's got a subtitle in America. Um, in the UK, uh, it's just called Tiny. Um, is it called Tiny? Okay. I thought I saw something look slightly different. And we yeah. will get, and in fact, I've got the edition with the little sticker on it saying, you won the prize. Oh. Um, in addition with a few other people and I, I know we met another British author there and he said some interesting things about being uh, you know an author in Britain versus in America so I would love to see you know mm -hmm. what kind of differences you see as far as uh, children's yeah. books and being an author and and you know what this looks like around the world but what I'm going to do actually now is to read uh, a bit of a bio here that uh, Nicola sent along, because I don't trust Wikipedia to know if you were, <laughs> um, you know, still up to date Certainly on there. Don't trust what's on Wiki, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I tell my students, you can go there just to get a, a first blush look at something, but yes, don't absolutely. ever say, yeah, yes. don't make that your be-all, end-all when you're trying to reference something. So, so you were, uh, your family... Uh, is from Wales, and though you were born elsewhere. Um, you are trained as a zoologist at King's College, Cambridge, and then worked as a field biologist studying geese, bats, humpback, blue, and sperm whales. So uh, that's great. So you have yeah. proper science background. Uh, Nicola then worked as a presenter, assistant producer, and writer for the BBC Natural History Union before becoming an author. Um, you've done some other jobs in between there as creative writer, writing supervisor. Um, you have written adult novels, newspaper columns, children's television series, children's nonfiction and fiction and poetry. Um, and you are the author of more than 40 titles, and your books are translated in more than 12 different languages. That's good. Uh, your Nicola's books are widely reviewed in the UK and US and have won prizes in the UK, US, Italy, and France. Your picture book, The Promise, which I have here, I read it this morning, okay, because it got so so many accolades, I was like, oh, I better sit down and read this one, <laughs> uh, was one of the New York Times top 10 picture books of 2014, and you were twice shortlisted for the AAAS Subaru Prize before winning it for Tiny or Tiny Microbes, which we have here, and this is also shortlisted for the Royal Society Science Book Prize for 2015, so that's a good uh, list to be on. And yeah, kids, kids, kids cho choose that, right? The kids determine the winner. The kids determine uh, the the AAAS one. I think is a combination of uh, of scientists and a panel and kids choosing. Mm. Okay, mm -hmm. but the Winston is like adults narrow it down, but then kids get to choose. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So, so that that you know, winning that or you know, at least being on that list, that's pretty good. Yeah, it's always lovely when it's the kids that I won a prize for one of my sort of fiction, non-fiction crossover books last year about man-eating lions, and that mm -hmm. was entirely chosen by uh, by children, and that was absolutely lovely. And I went to the prize giving, and there were fifteen hundred kids, kind of hysterical with excitement. Oh, that's um, so exciting! See, yeah, that, it was, it was that's lovely. what you want for a kids author, right? You know, I mean. It's, it's nice adults like it and the teachers like it, but when the kids are the ones that are really excited. And the, kids are, the kids are such a lovely audience to write for because they let you know when they don't like it and they're completely honest about it. But when they do like it, they have great questions and great insights and um, 
uh, you know, I do a lot of work with live audiences of children and lots of work in schools, uh, and I just love it. Yeah, so I, I'm not going to read the rest of your bio, but it does expand <laughs> upon all these things you do that are outreach to children that are helping them learn to write, you know, yeah. to inspire them to write, and uh, not just write, but also write about science and using the natural world as your, um, uh, you know, as their um, inspiration. So, so before we talk more about that, I'm going to let Jeff have a turn to talk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Usually it's the other way Table's around. Table's turned, yeah. right, Jeff? <laughs> yeah, and, and Joanne keeps saying, but, but, but. <laughs> but you've already, you've already given me the, uh, the segue to what I was thinking where I wanted to start was we are received wisdom, which may or may not be true, and you can comment, is that, is that kids come into the world and they have, they have a sense of wonder and curiosity and everything, and they're already the perfect audience for science. And, uh, and nature until we beat it out of them, presumably. For the science writer, for the adult writing for children, how do you uh, put yourself in the place to go back to communicating to that natural sense of, of wonder and curiosity and exciting that? Because we know, we just heard the children tell you, but they, they love, your, love your books. And so it's like, how do you make that connection? Where, what is well, it? I, I have an enormous advantage which is that on the outside, I'm a woman of a certain age, I'm 50, whatever, <laughs> I'm seven. But actually, on the inside, I'm eight. Okay. <laughs> so I haven't got to go back very far. Um, that and I'm saying it, that kind of privilege, but really that's true. I really am absolutely the same person on the inside that I was when I was eight. And I remember the feelings and impressions I had you know, seeing wild animals, noticing things in nature around me for the first time as a, as a quite a young child. Uh, and I kind of remember the way I thought and the way I saw things. And that really, really helps to get, to get inside information in the right way. Um, and also, I, 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 the first writing I did was actually for television rather than for books. Mm -hmm. And when you're writing for television... It really teaches you, you know, you have 30 seconds and you have to get your message over in that time. There's no, you know, that's an absolute, it's an absolute. So you have to make choices about what you're going to tell. Do you get more direct feedback with the television writing, a quicker, a quicker feedback from the kids sometime or... Is that still uh, separated? Well, no, just m much more brutal feedback from very horrible producers. <laughs> you know, like the whip is cracked, you know, right from the start. But so that was good training about, you know, thinking about choosing what information I, I, I give to my readers. Um, so you think you're one of the few who's escaped having the, the wonder removed from you as you grew up? Yeah, and I don't know, I don't know why... Why that? And I obviously I see that happen because I work with with children right way across age groups. I I kind of think that that if they have that wonder reinforced with information and ex and crucially I think experience the natural world. Because you know, my 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 area of science is very much biology, very much natural mm -hmm. history. If children's enthusiasm is reinforced with direct experience and also with um, sorry, that's my phone. Um, with okay. the ability to to try and package up and communicate their own experience, so they find their own voice through that experience of the natural world. I think even if it, if the wonder kind of departs when the when the hormones start to rise, at some point down the line they'll get it back. So if 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 they are. Mm, Approached in the right way, this is our lesson yeah. for adult teaching, yeah. right? If yeah. we do it the right way, we can recover that yeah. that natural wonder. You think? If yeah, only I we knew that, exactly the think, right way. But you know, from the point of view of, of of parents and educators, I think very often parents, particularly dads, I think I have to say, is a, a kind of a terrible gender generalization. But I think particularly dads really want to be in the position of knowing, and if they don't know mm -hmm. about they feel they can't read about it or talk to their kids about it. Mm -hmm. And I, what I would love to say to all parents and teachers is 
you discover something together. And if you discover something together, that has all sorts of benefits in terms of your relationship with the children, with the child. But also what it shows children is that is learning and finding out is something that goes on forever. It's not yeah. something that stops. You know, that, that knowledge is not finite. Um, that, that finding out about stuff and engaging with the world. What I always say is what I want my readers, what I want my books to do is to start my readers on a lifelong dialogue with the world. Mm -hmm. A lifelong conversation with the world around them. So, so that um, what I'm hearing there is one of our, our key science communication issues should be to make sure to help people realize that science is about not knowing but finding out. Yes, absolutely. And so often when science is, it is presented, and particularly my experience of science, you know, particularly I did mm -hmm. three science A levels, so I did you know, physics, chemistry, and biology. Uh, and the way the physics and the chemistry, well, particularly the chemistry was taught, was here is a block of stuff that you have to know. Take this great big dollop of fact and swallow it down. Mm -hmm. um, and it was never presented as, okay, science is an approximation, hopefully mm -hmm. an ever closer approximation. But you, as a child learning this stuff, can be part of the next approximation. Yeah. And, and, and that is such an important message to get over. I've thought about that and read some things. And I did, my degree is in physics, so I've done math and physics. And oh, every one of those, stuff. yeah, all of those textbooks presents knowledge. Of, well, here are the things that are known, and now you can do the proof. <laughs> uh, you know, especially math books, like, where do these theorems come from? There is never any never really any sense in them of discovery and blind alleys and, and finding out, which I think and some people I admire think is maybe a better way to go about teaching science is to show it as a process. Yes, and a story. It's a story. It's you know, a story. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm always saying to people, go banging on endlessly about the power of narrative. Mm -hmm. um, narrative is the psychological carrier bag that human beings have been using mm -hmm. since we sat around the first campfire chewing on mammoth bones to, to communicate all sorts of information and some of the information that you can communicate with a narrative might be you know out of your head and some mm -hmm. of it might be uh, the best way to catch mammoths mm -hmm. you know. or both uh, or, yeah. or both or both, actually. Of course, I love mixing up the both. But, mm -hmm. but, uh, story, putting, telling the stories that are in science, uh, the stories of the people, the stories of the discovery. You know, when you're discovering something, you're right at the edge of what we know. That's hugely exciting, and that sense of excitement, I think, sometimes, well, very often in the British education system, I have to say fails to communicate itself to, to, to young scientists. And also the word play, you know? Yeah. We do our best stuff as human beings, our best creative stuff, when we are mucking about. Mm -hmm. and, and, and play can be all sorts of different things. You know, it, 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 in our, I, I guess through kind of a long line of kind of Puritan work ethic, the idea of play has acquired a bad reputation, particularly in, in our two cultures, in, in America mm -hmm. and, and in the UK, so that play is a bad thing. Play is what you do in your time off. Instead of teaching people how to play in a more, more serious, more thoughtful way, mm -hmm. so that you keep your brain in the play space mm -hmm. when you're working, so that you can think sideways and underneath and from behind. Well, that's and, that's and the way we we did everything in, in my physics lab, really, was you, you have uh, larger goals, perhaps, but you play your way there, and that was particularly clear in uh, when I was doing uh, in type of computer programming, and you learn this. You, you write something that does it, then you write the program once you've learned how to do it. Uh, and so, really, it divides up into play and solving the problem, and then sorting it out and turning it basically into the math text that says, oh, this is the way it was a priori. But, so yeah. Joanne and I are both sitting here agreeing, yes, it's narrative, <laughs> yes, it's play, yes, yes, for that whole thing is entirely true. I mean, this is true in your lab too, isn't it, Joanne? 
Oh yeah, definitely. You know, definitely encourage people to yeah, you know, get in, you know, explore a little bit, and that that's how things are happening. So, um, you know what? I I have a giant stack of books that was <laughs> kindly sent to me, and it made me sad that I don't have five to eight year olds, eleven year olds anymore. Right? They're all college age or one's a high schooler. But what I'd like to do is hold up a few of these and have you tell us a little bit about them because yes, sure. some, Absolutely. Of, Absolutely. some of these are so intriguing and and honestly I'm learning things by reading them which you know this is one of the things I loved about having kids was my chance to re-explore things. Oh yeah. You know, it, not just you know <laughs> them playing outside, but the fact there are so many wonderful books out there for them to read on all sorts of topics. So, even things that I wasn't interested in in high school, but was forced to maybe history or something. But then you read a kids book about it, and you go, oh, this is actually really exciting. Yes, and I think absolutely. if someone was like, you know, I don't like science, but I think I should learn a little more, I would say go to the kids section. Mary, mm -hmm. and don't and don't go to the internet. Don't go to the internet because the internet will give you. <laughs> Unpackaged, unreferenced tsunami of gunk. Yeah. Go to a good children's yeah. library, talk to a good children's librarian, and find a great narrative non fiction title that'll give you the stories behind the facts. Yeah, Jeff and I love libraries, so. Mm -hmm. oh, we all love them. We all love them. <laughs> so uh, let's, let's start with this book. Uh, oh, Rob. What's you. Eating You? And I, I learned the most from this book. Yeah, and I bet you. <laughs> I tell you, the whole time I was writing that book, I was going, <laughs> itching your head <laughs> yeah, examining myself for parasites it's obviously about parasites um, it's part of a series of books part of a series of six books and each one is kind of a biological essay but um, with a very kind of jolly jokey voice but aided and abetted with fantastic illustrations a wonderful illustrator called Neil Layton who it's very, very clever because he gets lots of information into his illustrations, but they're very playful and very funny. So while kids are laughing, they get the information. Um, it was quite tough for me to write that book because I didn't do any of the parasitology courses when I did my degree. So I had to start parasitology from scratch when I did that. And I have to say I found it absolutely fascinating. I think of all the research I've done for my books, the research I did for that book was the most truly mind blowing. Um, well, the, and it must show it must show that you really dug in because I felt like I'm a biologist, I'm not a parasitologist, but I learned so much from it. Oh, so. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you did. I mean, the extent to which parasites horribly manipulate their hosts was was just like something out of a horror movie, but of course kids love all that. They love all that gruesome. Yep. I quite often get I quite often get complaints from adults, you know, about um about how gruesome my books are and how terribly unsuitable they are for little kids. <laughs> little well, let's, kids let's, let's completely adore it. Here we go. <laughs> let's then let's talk about this one. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> okay. Well, any biologist knows that poo is a fantastically uh, powerful tool. So actually really that book is about, it's about scientific method, it's about the, some of the ways that we go about finding, finding out about animals. I mean, my very first job when I left school before I went to university, I worked as a research assistant for the Wild Fowl Trust and I collected goose poo. That's what I did. I ran after a scientist, <laughs> a scientist called Mervyn Owen and collected goose poo and from the goose poo we worked out how the geese were utilizing the nature reserve on which they lived, what the carrying capacity of that nature reserve might be ultimately. So there was also, yeah, and animals who <laughs> to communicate. So that, and also to navigate actually, um, what, what uh, um, hippopotamuses do when they, they, they come out of the river at night and they do big dollops along the route. So even if it's really, really super dark, mm. when they come back from grazing, they can sniff their way back to their favorite bit of river. That's so <laughs> interesting. <laughs> um, 
I'm sure anybody who's who's following me has seen the picture of my. He was 15 mm -hmm. at the time, yeah. just looking <laughs> delighted. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it, it's it's particularly popular with boys, I must say. But <laughs> little girls like it too. Yeah. Oh, it's pretty funny. And these are the same uh, illustrations. Yeah, they're the same series. And the, the last one that in that series, which I've had the most complaints about, um, is actually called Deadly, um, and it's about animals that kill people. Oh. Mm -hmm. But actually, well, the whole thesis of Deadly is, is, is that human beings don't. We don't have a choice about. We, we have a choice about how we behave. We have a choice about whether we share our planet with other animals that are difficult to live with, like man-eating lions and tsetse flies. But animals don't have a choice. They are just equipped by X million years of evolution to do what they do. Um, but actually, I have, I've, had, I've had several parents email me and tell me what a terrible person I am for publishing mm -hmm. this frightfully traumatic book. Oh, um, well, I think, I think, I mean, they're going to see it at some point. And, well, um, yeah, exactly. And what do we say? You know, are we going to pretend that polar bears run around in the Arctic eating cheese sandwiches, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a good point. That's a good point. Aren't, just in passing, aren't... My impression, I don't have children, so I, I can't say for sure, and I've known some special ones, but my feeling has always been that children are much more interested and much more resilient than their parents who seem to worry an awful lot about how easily damaged they'll be. Well, yeah, absolutely. And, of course, what, we, what, what I always remind editors and parents who say, oh, how can you talk about death and destruction? Oh. Um, I say, you know, children's books, stories, narratives, are the places where human beings have always rehearsed mm -hmm. difficult, dangerous, frightening material and rehearsed it in a safe context and rehearsed their reactions to it. Um, Those hideous so fairy tales. Children's and... books have a very important role to play in exposing mm -hmm. children to the, the hard, difficult, sad, unpleasant realities of the world in a safe context so that they're mm -hmm. prepared. You know. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And well, and um, one thing I remember about my kids, and most everybody might remember from being a kid themselves, you find a book that catches your imagination, you're going to read it over and over mm -hmm. and over. <laughs> that, that's the kind of really, really, really amazingly special, humbling thing about being a writer for children. It's an honor because if a child loves your book, you are part of you're part of that person. Right. Because you know, the books that I read when I was a little kid, and like you say, you know, you read them again and again, and you get to the end, you go back to the beginning, you get to the end, you go back to the beginning. <laughs> I read Lord of the Rings straight off six times from cover to cover. <laughs> um, and, and it's part of me. It's, it's part of who I am. Yeah. Um, My oldest... Uh, was uh, in love with Richard Scary, 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 oh, whatever. My, and my, my, ne my, my nephew and my niece absolutely loved my Yeah, I, we had to keep buying cars, trucks, and things, or whatever that one is called. Lonely Worm. I love Lonely Worm. Do you remember yeah. Lonely Worm? Yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I, uh, we had to buy multiple copies of the same book because he read them so he wore them out. Wore oh, them out like okay. books wearing out, but they wear out, or you know, their little his little siblings would rip a page out. And just yeah, I just love, like, you know, I love it when kids come to me. It happened to me recently at the Hay Festival. You know, you have a line of kids wanting their new book signed, but there's always a couple of kids who bring who bring their worn copy that's all kind of broken and scribbled on and scrunched up, and they bring that to be signed. Is, that, is there a particular one that shows up more often than others? Um, well, I, I guess the shark one shows up quite often. The shark is that, one the most scrunched. Is it this one or yeah, is there a different one? sharks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that comes very scrunched, usually from a very particular sort of little boy. <laughs> <laughs> so that and, actually, and the oldest one, Big Blue Whale. I don't have a copy of Big Blue Whale, but I do Big have... Blue Whale, it's very old now. It's 17 years old. Wow. Oh. So, yeah, so I've got these two called Read and well, Wonder. The, re the reason I wrote Surprising Sharks was that I've done, you know, I've spent a lot of time working on small boats, and I'm, I'm pretty stoic about most animals that might hurt you. But I, ha I, I used to have a real thing about sharks. Mm. I was really, really scared of the idea of sharks. 
Right. And when I wrote the first version of that book, I wrote a book that was all about the fear, that was all about the, the fin cutting through the dark water, the really proper, you know, jaws for five-year-olds thing. And then I realized how ridiculous that was, because that was just telling people what they already knew. You know, we all know that we sharks are scary. Duh. <laughs> um, so I sort of went back to the drawing board and then wrote about the stuff that perhaps people might not know. And it's been really funny because there's just been a series out in the a BBC Natural History Unit series out here in the UK about sharks. And basically, you know, it's three programs, but most of it's in that book <laughs> that yeah. I wrote about. <laughs> well, we so have this, Shark Week in America, so right. I know it's so good that they're getting attention. But you know, it, when I started, first started going to sea a very, very long time ago, you know, you wouldn't see sharks often, but we would see them. And a few years ago, I spent a month at sea in the Sea of Cortez, watching sperm whales. Oh, sorry, what time okay. And um, and you know what? We didn't see. I think we saw one shark. Mm. In, in three weeks. Oh, wow. Yeah, well, I guess some little kid got his leg bit in Florida off Cocoa Beach just last week, so they're um, still there. They're still, they're there. still there. They're, they're still, still there. there. But, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't expect to walk around, I don't know, in, in African grassland and <laughs> be able to go up to a lion and say, Hi, lion. I That's right. Lion That's right. Is. You're so cute. You know, and yet we kind of expect to be able to get in the sea with sharks. Yeah. And like they're just going to be there waiting for you. Yeah, absolutely. And they aren't going to attack you because they're predators, you know. Crazy. So here's um, a couple of books in that same series, but these are at the word listen because they're CDs. So we've yes. got One Tiny Turtle and Bat Loves the Night. Well, I used to study bats. Um, okay. So uh, when I came to write bats, I knew way too much to fit into 600 words. Um, so that was a really good lesson in editing, writing that one. And I'm getting it. In, in also how you can explain quite difficult things. For, you know, echolocation is the physics of echolocation. It's very difficult. But mm -hmm. actually, all you need to do with little kids is to get them just a feel of it. They don't need to understand about wavelengths and frequencies and Doppler shift mm -hmm. and da -da -da -da. All they need to get the idea of is that this animal that looks like it's silent is actually shouting its head off mm -hmm. and then listening to the echo. It's just the and exposure that's valuable, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. The idea. You, just, you just give them an exposure to the idea, like you say. You well, let me, let me, okay, in passing again, Joanne, but let me ask you a question. Years ago, I was talking about science how, how to reach young kids with science with a friend, a colleague, and we were thinking about sort of products and things, and we had an idea of jigsaw puzzles that would have science words on them and would be devoid of any explanation of those words. It would just be the words for the fun of the words because we felt that the initial exposure then prepares them for a reception later maybe. But yeah. No, that, I think that's, that about no, the right I think, idea? I think that's a really, really, really good idea. I think that's a really, really good idea. So that you start putting that vocabulary and those images into readers' heads so that you just put them in there and they smoosh around and, you know, who knows what they do. And they're fun because the words are, are funny sometimes and kids kids yeah. like saying sounds and words and things and this is the idea. I have some nonsense poems that I started working on about the elements for Oh, brilliant! For for kids, and it's mostly just sounds, uh, because that that I've I've known some kids who were about that age, and one in particular I was giving cello lessons to, and we would we would play games because she just loved rhymes and sounds and and sort of stream of consciousness and these things. Okay, back well, to the books. <laughs> that 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 shark book. One of the things I do with that shark book is um, I get the kids to say some of the shark names, so I get them. Um, I get mm. them to say Wobegong, and they're mm. always they always have a fit of the giggles about the word Wobegong. For some reason, that is intrinsically funny to kids, but right. it's great to get them to say it. And when I do the bat, I do a presentation about the bat book, and I tell them about the littlest bat, about bumblebee bats, which of course has got a fabulous Latin name. It's Crazy Nicturus Thonglongii. You know, it's <laughs> yes, quite that's a perfect. Body, you know, and and kids love it. They love you it. Do you have to fight with editors who say you can't 
give these kids these Latin words and say, well, no, I, they're I, fun. I never allow, would probably not allow me to use the Latin word in the book. But, of course, when I'm working with a live audience, mm -hmm. then, you can, <laughs> then you can say it. Yes. So, <laughs> each of those four books in this particular series, I have a, I'll have a different illustrator. Let's talk about choosing an illustrator. Uh, how that happens? Is it you? It's Is it the publisher? It's a lovely job. And one of the reasons why Walker, Candlewick in America, are so fabulous to work with is I get final say. Mm. That's great to work with. So I, when I finish the text, the text always comes first. Mm -hmm. So when the text is done and we're all happy with the text, then we might start to think about who we use as an illustrator and and designer and the uh, editor will come with their ideas and we'll talk about it and we'll come to an agreement about who we would like to use and then of course you might not get that person because a very wonderful very successful illustrator might not have a gap in their schedule for years mm -hmm. um, so there's a certain amount of kind of negotiation and argy bargy about but usually it, you know I pretty much always got who I wanted which is lovely and it and it's lovely because it means every book can have its own atmosphere. It does. Mm -hmm. Well, that's how I was just looking. These these four I just held up all have a different person. If yeah. someone shares the last name with you, no, no, no relative, no relative. <laughs> I was hoping to hear a wonderful story about that. Um, I would be lovely to work with one of my relatives. I'd love it. <laughs> So uh, let me hold up a few more books uh, because I'm sure it'll bring out more things to say. So this one is actually pretty funny. <laughs> Just Cubs, it's so simple. It, it, that, ca that absolutely came out. I mean, all my books are always connected with something in my life. But that book was absolutely connected with a place that I lived, the house that I lived in before the house I'm in now. It backed onto the River X in Devon. So actually, the illustrations in that book, I sent photographs of where I used to live to Salvatore Rubino, and he just, you know, drew the river where I used to live. And it is absolutely true. Every morning in that house, the first sound I heard when I woke up in the morning was the sound of the duck. <laughs> and, you know, I'd walk over the bridge, that bridge, in the morning and the ducks would be feeding underneath the bridge and at night they'd be floating in the middle of the river or roosting underneath the bridge. Uh, and so that, that book kind of wrote itself really. And there's a bit at the back where it says about, um, uh, uh, about the ducks being awake at night. I was in choir practice one night. <laughs> and you know sometimes in choir, it's just quite naturally there's a quiet point, everybody stops talking, everybody stops singing. And in the quiet there was this little noise <laughs> turn the lights off, turn the lights off. So we turned the light off in the room and we all went to the window and looked outside. And the window backed onto the park and in the dark, on a wet November night, there was about 20 mallard hoovering up the worms <laughs> from the lawn. And they were talking to each other, they were just going... <laughs> Really kind of conversationally, it was brilliant. So all of that went into the book, you know, it was it just kind of wrote itself. It was it was lovely to do. It, really. it was a very nice book, and of course I couldn't help but hearkening back to my childhood and what I read to the kids was Make Way for Ducks. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. So it's just such a um you know, it's like, ooh, even for me, you know, I'm drawn to your book because of something in my childhood. Yeah, so, and you kind of you're kind of reinventing the wheel the whole time really for a new generation of kids, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's one. Before we talk about the promise and tiny creatures, um, this this is a different kind of book. Let's, let's okay. So this any is, picture. The lion who stole my arm. It's fiction. It is it's a real conservation story. So the roots of that story are absolutely in the real world. You know, I worked very closely with a uh, with a conservation organisation in Mozambique. I sent the text off at every stage to make sure that I wasn't representing what was happening in the real world uh, unrealistically. But it's a fiction. It's it's fiction. It's a made up plot. It's a patchwork of things that could really have happened or have really happened, but the, the line of the narrative is something that I made up. And I did that because I wanted, I wanted it to be a really exciting read 
I wanted it to be something that would engage children emotionally and uh, that they would keep turning the pages because of a, an exciting plot, but that really gave them, through that plot, through that story, um, an idea of what it was, what it's really like to be in that country, living with lions on your doorstep. That you know, if you make a wrong move, might eat you. Um, and here's an actual photo. Really, yeah, and that's the real. That's the that's the real place. The real. Uh, uh, part of Mozambique, the Nyasa uh, Carnival project in northern Mozambique. And when I finished that text, I sent it off to Colleen Begg, who is the lead scientist for that project. And it, she didn't write back. I thought, oh, God. <laughs> and then I had this fantastic email about three weeks later saying, you've told our story. Please, mm -hmm. can, I, can I get copies of this in Portuguese? So I can use it in the reserve because it's putting over all the messages that we want to put over to people about how you can learn to live with lions. So that was the best thing that could have happened. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So percentage-wise, how many uh, children's nonfiction versus children's fiction have you written? Well, I've written six of those now. Of uh, that lion who stole my arm. There's six of those in that series. Um, and I've done fiction, pure fiction, for an, a different publisher for for Random mm -hmm. House. So probably about two thirds, two thirds to a third, maybe. So mo mostly. Now but actually now approaching half and half because I've done a lot more fiction in the last couple of years. So let's mm -hmm. talk about before we talk about our focus book, the tiny creatures. Let's talk about yeah. the promise. <laughs> okay. Um. You, I'm sure, know a book called The Man Who Planted Trees. Yes. And it's published uh, over sixty years ago now in France. Hugely influential. Uh, the story, uh, fictional story, of um, Elzia Bouffier, uh, a French peasant who just plants trees quietly, <laughs> without him making fuss about it. He just plants and plants and plants and plants. And over the course of 40 years, the arid landscape of uh, the region of southern France where he lives is transformed. The trees bring back the rainfall. Uh, the trees bring back livelihoods for people. They they reinvigorate little villages that now have uh, water supply and wood and all that kind of stuff. So it's a message about environmental transformation, but also about the power of the individual. And my editor in England asked me to write a picture book version of it. And I said, I don't want to rewrite somebody else. I don't want to rewrite somebody else's story. Also, I want to write something that's got an urban setting. Right. Partly because because tree planting in urban environments it is very, very important, particularly with climate change. Um, and also because most kids in the world over the next 100 years are going to be urban kids. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to put... Uh, I wanted to put it in an urban context. The other thing I wanted to do is I wanted to put a child who was having a really difficult start mm -hmm. at the heart of the story because one of the most important things for me in my writing is to say to children with a difficult start, bad start doesn't need, need to mean a bad future. Things can change. Your life can improve. Um, so that's the reason that I put a street child at the heart of that story. And you know, that story is very strange because I've read it in all sorts of different contexts now to all sorts of different kids. And it always goes down well with adults and with children. Even the smallest children seem to understand it. But the kids who really get it are the kids who really need it. <laughs> that's well, that's good. There was a, a child. There was a child in. I'll just quickly tell you this. There was a child in a school in Boston that I was working in uh, just last fall. And this little boy came in. He came in with his minder. He hid behind the bookcases. He was clearly very unhappy, disturbed. And it, it, nobody was turning a hair because this was clearly the, the way this child always behaved. I went on with my session, finished the session by reading The Promise, which takes almost exactly five minutes to read aloud. Um, and I noticed that there was somebody leaning against my legs 
I looked out, <laughs> the little boy who'd come in and hid behind the bookcases. He'd worked his way down to the front. He was leaning against <laughs> my leg. He pulled me down next to him and he said, that story is about me. Mm. Aww. So yeah. <laughs> the kids who it needs to speak to. And that that's, you know, I couldn't be more delighted with that. That's um, wonderful. Yeah, and yeah. you know, there's a lot of kids you'll never know how you touch their lives. It'll always be this mystery. <laughs> well, I mean, that's that's the magic of, of writing. It, uh, and once a book... Once a story is out in the world, it's not it's absolutely not mine anymore. It doesn't belong mm -hmm. to me anymore. It belongs to the people who read it. And very often with that book particularly, children ask me questions about it and they say, Well, you know, who was the old lady? And mm -hmm. what's the girl's name? And I say, I don't know. I've no mm -hmm. idea. What do you think? <laughs> and I deliberately did that. And I very often do that with my stories, is I leave yeah. little loose ends. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. so, that, so that my readers can pick them up and People claim to whatever it is they want. Yeah, yeah absolutely. They, and then it's they claim to hate the loose ends, but it actually sort of draws them in. And I had one story that I wrote that had a few of those that, I, that came out the way I wanted to. And the number of people who surprised me by saying, but what really happened after the end? I said, I don't know. Yeah. It's a story that stopped there. I, I quit writing it. So, no, but what happened after this? <laughs> do you do you sometimes do you sometimes find yourself wondering about characters that you've made up? Oh yeah, I and do you know, too. That bonkers. <laughs> the real the really good ones stay with you too. You yeah. think about them like, well, I wonder what he's up to now. <laughs> I do. I don't use any kind of catches. I think stupid. You made this person up, you know. But you yeah. do. Still, you do still think they, about. Them. Well, they become very alive and. The best I once I tried to explain the process of writing fiction, and to me it feels most like remembering what has happened to these people. And of course, once I've remembered it and written the story, they become memories of these people, yeah. and well, and they behave that way really. Yeah, yeah, that's that's it. You're right. It's very interesting how you know different people have different different experiences of the the writing, and um, very often. You know, people say things like remembering or uncovering or discovering. But actually, mm -hmm. I have to say that's that's in my experience, a lot of my female writer friends do the uncovering, discovering mm -hmm. that, that, mm -hmm. that you and I are talking about. But quite a lot of male writers do the driving, making, creating. Yeah, amazing. yeah, and and they unfortunately become bestsellers, and I don't usually care to read them. But. <laughs> 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 quality, not quantity. Really. Yeah, yeah. Um, so actually, let's. Uh, it's I'm tossed up between. Let's talk about UK, US versus uh, or yeah. tiny creatures. What would you like to do first? Don't mind. You choose. You choose. You drive. Well, you can you can do a, an intermediate one on process because I was going to ask and say, since we were just talking about writing, and you've given me words. I was reading the. Uh, Joanne sent me a link to a Guardian, uh, brief Guardian profile in which you talked about. Are you sitting in that room right now? Sitting in this room where you write. Well, I'm standing uh, which, actually, so I've got a standing yes, up. Yes, which is which is really lovely and and the the quiet that goes with it. But the useful part for me, where you were talking about input and output, and I'm usually one for a long input time and a fairly short output. I don't struggle so much over the output with the input and getting to the output. But I don't know what I was going to ask. I was going. I think I was going to say it was very useful to have those ideas. But there's the preparation for me, the remembering, the sorting out, and things before, long before the putting words in an order, which yeah. is something. But it once I know what's happening, that part seems much easier for me. Uh, and most of the work goes on in the input phase for me. I don't. Is that true for you? Do you think that? It, it, output, very, output can be a struggle very, to get it right. You learn things. It varies but. so much from book to book. It really, really does. And also it varies for me now because I have, you know, I've got quite a schedule. Mm. Um, there, isn't, there isn't any breathing time anymore between books. Right. So I finish one and right, the next deadline is there you know, in my sights, on my horizon right now. So actually, the, the, the 
you know, you finish one book and you kind of gently cook the next mm -hmm. one. That doesn't happen anymore. So mm -hmm. the, the the cooking and the input is is overlapped. And now and now I have to do you know, I have to be quite efficient about that. So I've got two books that I want to do next year, a series of books and uh, 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 and uh, 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 another uh, picture book and another kind of poetry collection. And they're all kind of related. Mm -hmm. So I can do nice <laughs> stuff, but nice stuff that will feed all of them and be right, cooking right. for all of them at the same time. Um, so, I, you know, I have to be... Well, I have to. I have to manage my creative input. Very well, fast. and you've probably over the years, you know, it, it gets easier because you you sort of know. Okay, I know how to deal with an editor, and I know how to deal with an illustrator, like all these yeah, things. Sure. That that part gets easier. That part. Yeah. Gets yep. easier. But you know, every new book, it, it, I I, th I don't I don't know a writer who wouldn't say this. You know, you sit down to write a new book, and you think, oh, am I going to be able to do it? You know, am I going to be able to do it? Yeah, you well, know that. You look back on the earlier ones and say, gosh, that one was good. I wonder how that one ever happened. Yes! Because <laughs> I can't do that again. How did I do that? <laughs> well, that, let's talk about how you did this one, because this mm -hmm. one gets okay. all sorts well, of notes, and it's beautiful. beautiful, by the way, people. Well, it is beautiful. No, absolutely nothing to do with me. Emily Sutton is a genius. Um, I don't know anything about microbiology you know my my field is, <laughs> is is whole big animals usually with fur or feathers you know that's my <laughs> thing or, or, or swimming in the sea um so i had to do lots and lots of basic research i've got a huge great huge thick undergraduate microbiology textbook that i worked my way through and mainly made my brain explode to do that. <laughs> of course, although you're only writing, I mean, that's only about four and a half, it's only maybe 4,450 4, words. Right. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the right 450 words. You know. Um, so you have to make sure that you, 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 you've you picked, you've made a selection of information from the right pool of information. You've still got to get the pool of information in there. So it was mm -hmm. quite a lot of reading and revising I did a bit of cell biology as a graduate and, and revising a bit of my cell biology and thinking about all that. But with a book like that, it it's really the key concept in the narrative. And the key concept in that narrative was very, very simple, was okay everybody, there's these really, really diddy little things that are very important. Mm -hmm. You know. And and as long as my readers understand that, then I've done my job. And hey, just, but they they will probably though. I mean, look at these illustrations. They will at some you know be sitting yeah. in school one day and go oh, and they'll see that oh, absolutely. Like, and and that's like what I was talking about with with the echolocation thing. You mm -hmm. you give them a feel for the subject. You give them the seedbed. You give them the seedbed for the for for later knowledge. Yeah. Um. And you know, having a fabulous illustrator like Emily, who is not only has got a beautiful eye and can make things look gorgeous, but she's very good on getting good quality information content into the mm -hmm. industry. And it, she, and a, a she was there at the uh, the AAAS as well. Yes, she Pretty was. Good, nice, both yeah. of you. And Jeff and I are like big fans of like, you know, you've got a photographer, you've got an illustrator. But yeah. You had so many, it'd be hard to choose. <laughs> she, but she, she did her, her illustrations, they're... they're the one thing I noted particularly was that they were very rich yes. uh, in detail. And I thought these are illustrations. Uh, this is a book that parents need to read with their kids, and there is bound to be a lot of discussion about these pictures because the pictures themselves have so many stories in them. Absolutely. Uh, and that's exactly what you want an illustrator. You don't want an illustrator who just, um, you know, you write about a dog, so the illustrator does pictures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you want an illustrator who's gonna who's gonna put their own stuff in there. And the lovely thing about Emily is that she will put her own her own mm -hmm. creativity, her own ideas in there. But also, she's very very open to me saying, look, actually, for for instance, the first pet, first couple of spreads in that book, there was they had to have they had to look a certain way. They mm -hmm. had to have a blue whale and an ant represented in this way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Um, but the same way we were talking about kids loving funny words, they love details in pictures, don't they? Yes, yes, absolutely. Things to find. The next one that Emily and I are going to do together is called Lots, and it's about <laughs> diversity. Great. Oh, wonderful. So mm. I've just finished giving her, well, not completely finished, because it won't be finished till we've done, done it all, but I've, I finished the text earlier this, very early this year, um, and Emily is now, I've given her a whole lot of visual references, and she's now starting to work on those illustrations. But that will be a huge job, and there will be lots of conversations between the two of us about about what information goes in and how it goes in, and all of that. So this is great. this is an important message. Uh, it's useful for me because I told Joanne my secret uh, agenda was to find out how to write all the children's books that I want to write. But this <laughs> is also also good. Uh, for people who don't have the appreciation, who think that perhaps you take a weekend, put together a children's book, and then you're done. Writing, writing, putting together something like this, and particularly doing it in only 600 words is, is it's an the amazing most, it, it, and it's it a lot the most of work. thing I do. You know, a 60,000 word novel for grown up. Mm -hmm. Lots of room. Easy peasy. You can hide a lot of mistakes in sixty thousand words. Also, you know, you've got to, you've got room to maneuver. You haven't mm -hmm. got to make such difficult decisions. But but doing, you know, doing a picture book like that, a non-fiction picture book that has got real proper scientific content mm -hmm. in it. It's like second stage Ashtanga yoga for your brain. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm looking at your parasite and your microbe and how you had to learn. You, you need to make friends with Carl Zimmer. That's his area. Yes, oh, Carl Zimmer. I adore Carl Zimmer. <laughs> okay, <laughs> we, we won't talk about how much I adore Carl Zimmer. His ears are probably <laughs> Actually, Parasite Rex, you know, yep. really, I just I just kind of rewrote Parasite Rex for a younger audience, to be honest. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, that's that's the first thing I thought. You know, it's like, ooh, yeah. but it's it's amazing. So let let's talk uh, briefly. So uh, you were you and Emily, and yeah. there were a few others, and there was Kevin Fong who wrote a book. Called yes, Kevin Fong who wrote so that. This was at the AAAS yeah. uh, conference in San Jose, and this uh, Subaru Book and Film Prize. And Kevin said, he said a couple things, but one thing stood out to me, and I thought, why well, isn't this very British, how he, he said he goes to book signings in the UK and America, and he says, in the UK, you took some time to talk to them so everybody will feel obliged to buy the book, whereas in America, be like, keep up the good work, and then they walk out, they don't buy a book. <laughs> And I thought, well, yeah, if I don't have the money, I'm not buying your book. I'll oh. check it out from the library. Oh, that's incredibly sweet. No, I don't, I, I think, because he's writing for a slight, you know, he's writing for adults and, and young adults, so it's a slightly different yeah, thing. But kids, you would buy the book, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And the kids, and you know, kids, kids won't go for it unless they really, they really, they really like it. I mean, the thing, the thing I would say I noticed most in terms of difference between between America and the UK is that um, in American schools you, the library is still completely the heart of the school, the beating heart of the school whereas that is not the case in British schools. Well, British, mm -hmm. Many British schools have lost their libraries. And many we, British schools do not have a library. You know, know, one thing I remember as a kid and my kids and so many people in America could say this was like at the heart of yeah. growing uh, up in school was scholastic mm -hmm. books. Yeah. You know, and they have oh, book yeah. fairs a couple times a year and you know, it's just like just such a wonderful focus on on, you know, getting books to kids. Even and also the, the message that that your learning is not just the responsibility of your teachers. Mm -hmm. You can be the author of your own learning. You can be the curator of your own brain. You haven't always got to rely on somebody else to be curating your brain contents for you. You can do it for yourself. Uh, and I think that's incredibly important. And I think for kids, for the sort of kids, the very, very brightest kids who are bored in class mm -hmm. and the kids who have problems, those are the ones who are saved by the library and by the librarians with whom they can have a different yeah. Yeah. interaction, a different interface with information and education. It's so important and it's dire. It's 
tragically mm. on words that, that that is being lost in the British education system. Well, um, so I think libra that. libraries in the U.S. are in peril too, so maybe they we'll are. have a program on how we can save libraries because I was one of those people you just described who was saved by libraries and librarians. So libraries are now my favorite places and librarians are my favorite people. Yes, of course, we love because, librarians. Yeah, yes. they're the ones I who I always say that people. too. Librarians are some of my favorite people. I mean, oh, yeah. they just, people don't take advantage of librarians enough. They no. aren't there just to stamp your book. Or to you know shush right they they know things they know how to help you find what you need yes absolutely yeah. and they'll have a passion as well they'll have a passion yeah. yeah they'll be they'll either be there'll be one section in that library that they'll really think oh this bit go and look at this yeah. bit yeah all right so make make a note for the topic Joanne libraries yeah, definitely libraries yeah. <laughs> Uh, All by ourselves, Jeff. <laughs> yes, we can do it. Well, we've got authors to help, I think. That's true. That's yeah. tr well, that's the thing. I never hear an author, even though I'm sure they would love it if everybody bought their books, right? You know, it helps helps the bottom line. But no. I never hear anybody complain about a library because it's just so no. important, so important to bring, you know, everything. <laughs> Just runs out the door, <laughs> you know, to bring everything, um, make it accessible to people who might not normally. Yeah. I mean, I mean, having said that about school libraries in the UK, there are also some very wonderful new libraries that are uh, right in the heart of town. They are light and airy, and they've got a cafe, and you know, there's that 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 idea that this is this is somewhere you go to have a very nice time. You know, that I, will sh I will out. show pictures sometime that I took when I was in Salt Lake City. Their new public library is yeah. filled with books and with people and with places even for homeless people to come in and be comfortable. Yeah. And the atrium is gorgeous and has coffee shops and stores. And it's a place that people go to. You're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a really nice place for place people to go to. And it's, a, it, it's, a, it's just the most wonderful, truly civilized idea the library. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, a yeah. Great, really, really civilized concept. So it's an important symbol. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's an important symbol. Yeah. But it's also an important reality. It's an important mm -hmm. reality as, a, as a, a sense of community and a sense of community identity and a sense of uh, a sense of shared values and a sense of, you know what I said at the beginning, that dialogue with the world, that we all of us can go on having that dialogue with the world, um, being the curators of our own collection <laughs> inside our heads mm -hmm. all the way through our lives uh, and that we can do it without having to have access to an enormous fortune mm -hmm. um, and that once you put that stuff in your brain there's not very much that can take it away. Yeah. That's right, that's true. That's well, true. there we go, Joanne. Yeah, I I know you just summarized this this whole thing so beautifully, and we are at the end of an hour. And Nicola, this has been wonderful to speak with you today. Thank you. It's been lovely to chat to you, and just oh so glad to see you too. See the two of you. Brilliant. Yes, thanks very much, Nicola. Pleasure. Well, well and uh, you know, just keep us posted when you have new books come out. If we don't catch it with our eyes, we do try, but uh, you know, so help you keep. Keep them in the public eye, and you know and I, uh, that and the I think, I think enjoy we'll enjoy your books because uh, they're just wonderful. Thank we'll, you. So we'll much. mark we'll mark you down to have you back for the library episode, and then we can. Oh yes, that. please, we'll lovely. I'd love that. I'd love that. Okay, everybody, thank you for tuning in and for uh, in, enjoying with us our conversation with Nicola Davies and her amazing books and her thoughts on science and sharing that with children. So until next time, we'll see you later. Bye. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Nicole. Bye, Joanne.